Hi everybody, my name is Christina. I'm the gallery and studio manager at River Arts on Water Gallery, which due to the current pandemic COVID-19 coronavirus situation going on is closed to the public. However, we still wanna bring you some really great arts uh, programming and some opportunities that we don't normally get the chance to do. So one of these really cool things that we're doing, I am lucky enough to be interviewing several of our artists at River Arts on Water Gallery. And the first one I'm really excited to start off with is John Miller. John, you've been an artist with us, I think, pretty much from the beginning. Is that right? When we started in yes. 2011? Yeah. Um, so John, thanks for joining me. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your artwork? Well, um, I am John Miller, and um, I guess the way I talk about my own artwork is that I concentrate on um, outdoor, my outdoor experiences, which mean a lot to me, and I try to figure out how to convey both ideas and feelings that are associated with those experiences so that someone else who might have had similar sorts of moments can appreciate almost reappreciate their own moments through my art. So I try to connect with my art to people and experiences that they may have had that seem parallel somehow. Okay. So um, that's the gist of it. Sure. Can you tell us primarily what mediums you work in or what you enjoy to work with? I work in a lot of different mediums. Right now I'm concentrating on screen printing and um, for some reason, and this probably says something about me that I might not even want to have to face, <laughs> but I, I often take on things that are awkward for me and difficult and um, challenge me in ways that don't always make me feel like I'm very skilled. And oh. so I try to figure out how to work through that to the point where I feel like I know what I'm doing and I think that the reason I do it is because um, I'm wary of copying myself and I'm wary of uh, becoming too facile where something is almost like too easy. So it's a sort of a way of testing whether or not I can actually express the ideas and feelings that I have inside me. Because I think it's really easy to get kind of caught up in the razzle dazzle of making art, feel good yeah. about what you've done and keep doing that and almost drift away then from the the real reason you're making it. So it's it's almost a, I guess I might compare it to the, the, the vanity of, of like a, a kind of bodybuilding. If you just <laughs> like are lifting weights to look pretty, then eventually you're not doing anything. Uh, and <laughs> I'd rather, I'd rather do something. I'd rather right. almost test whether or not I actually know what I'm doing or not. And if I can, you know, kind of work in this world and, and um, communicate my ideas. Okay. Thank you. What would you say then is the hardest part about being an artist in the way that you do it? I'd say that the, the hardest part might be the... Um, and I'm not saying this as though it discourages me in the process, but the sort of self-doubt that's very much built into, yeah. I think, um, creative endeavors. Because um, for me, and I, I think that I that probably every single project I work on, I go through some sort of psychological cycle where I'm all excited about the idea. I start kind of putting it together. And then at some point I start looking at what I've done. And I say, oh my God, you know, what made you think that you were even capable of doing this? You know, I'm like, why are you doing this? You can't show this in the real world. And you, you, you really should, you don't have any talent. You don't have any, you got nothing, you know, oh. stop, 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 stop. And my experience tells me, keep working, keep working, right. keep working. And sometimes with projects where I've thought that, there's nothing there. I'll walk away and I'll come back and look at it a week later. I think, oh my God, you know, that is, that's got something, you know? So I, I think that one of the hardest things is separating what even our momentary self-criticisms from the actual project and considering the project of ha as having a life of its own, let it live, push it to completion. Um, and that part of 
uh, the process is to go through a very critical evaluation that might not always be pleasant and eventually you'll get to a point where there's almost like a crescendo effect and you start thinking, yeah, 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 I got it, I got it, I can do it, boom, 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 and it, and it almost is like it finishes itself. And right. um, I've, had, I've had a lot of experience as an athlete racing and a lot of the races that I have been in have been longer. Same kind of thing can happen in that where you deplete your resources in a way and you start to suffer and you can even like hit the grand piano. So there's, there's like nothing left. You're burning just on, you're going on fumes and it's easy to go through like depression in a marathon or something like that, long ski race. And um, you just have to separate yourself from it and just mm -hmm. keep going, you know? And yeah. um, I think art, art's like that too. It can be kind of like, a marathon it's you know it's not like a sprint you just keep going right. keep try and improve keep trying to get better keep training keep thinking keep creating Thank but it's you. Not easy. <laughs> that's such a good answer and I think it's something it's a really good point to bring up especially with young artists it's really easy to get discouraged from the get-go because you're constantly comparing yourself to what's out there and other work that people are doing and I appreciate that you brought that up, that even people who have been doing this for a really long time have these moments of, am I good enough? Is it something I should be putting out there? And um, one of my favorite quotes, I think it's a Picasso one, is that inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. Yes. Um, and I love yep. to tell that to my students when I teach and just like, there's maybe this myth out there that artists get struck with this genius idea and then they just right. they go into a frenzy and it comes out a masterpiece and that right. can be further from the truth or maybe that right. does happen but that first product you create is often not the one that sees the light of day at the exactly end of so i, I think sort of along those lines too it's almost like you have to be you have to be working because um talent is it's just a, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's just something that's like being pretty or being, you know, there's, it's, there's nothing there in a way, you know, you have to do something with it. You, you, um, you have to be working so that eventually if you, um, if you continue to work, you yourself will start to see stuff in your own work that is almost like revealing things about you that you realize are also ideas you can rework back into your own art it becomes even more personal over time sure yeah so in sort of changing direction slightly you mentioned a long ski race and i'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your background um have you always been an artist and what maybe are some things you like to do outside of art i know personally you're a skier and that you like to take canoe trips things like that um can you tell us a little bit about what you like to do outside of art and maybe how it blends into your art then? Right. Yeah. I, um, uh, well, first off, uh, uh, to get at the question of have I always been an artist? And I would say no. Okay. But I would say that from um, the time I was a little kid, I was always getting praise from other people that were, they told me I was an artist. Okay. But I, I um, somehow early on realized, for example, that there was a difference between being able to draw and being able to draw things realistically and actually being an artist. Um, and yeah. so the idea of what, what it means to be an artist is, in my mind, it's not necessarily the same thing as what some people might think. So um, I think, for example, uh, maybe the, the best way for me to say it in a, in a kind of simple way is that it doesn't matter how well you speak if you have nothing to say. And <laughs> so in a way, you know, uh, the, the razzle dazzle of being able to draw something really well, but, but you're not really communicating anything. Um, what is that? And um, so for me, uh, as a result of the things I was hearing from other people calling me an artist when I wasn't sure that's what I was. And as I looked at art in the real world in all its various forms, I got a better sense of what, it, what, it, what I thought it might be. And that, thinking about what art is and both what it can be, 
um, maybe where society itself doesn't sort of mesh with what I think art is and the way that people think about what art is, all of that has also fueled my art. So I have uh, thought a lot about what I do and how I do it and ask myself constantly, is this art or is it not? Because I think that I, I can easily make things that might impress somebody, but I don't really think it's even good art. <laughs> or worth doing. Or worth doing, yes. And so, um, so in, in answer to that question, I've always been an artist, no. And I would say that um, I really didn't even become comfortable thinking about uh, labeling myself an artist probably until I was in my 40s. Okay. And, um, I, I would, th there's a, a quote by this uh, poet who, whose name is Rainer Rilke, and, and it, it kind of applies to this. And I remember reading it, you know, quite some time ago, and it made great sense to me, but Rainer Rilke had said something like, um, to write poetry at 20 is to be 20, but to write poetry at 40 is to be a poet. And I think <laughs> that in some respects, you know, it takes some experience, it takes some some uh, life experience. It mm -hmm. takes thinking about what you value. It takes thinking about what you think is important um, to get to a point where you can actually try to infuse whatever it is you're making with your values and the kinds of things that actually are substantive. And um, right. in my opinion, can help to add to the idea of something being art as opposed to just, you know, like a really nicely done thing but uh, not necessarily meeting the category right so then um uh, answering the question about other things that i've done i've always that was way more interesting than my first question thank you for doing that <laughs> no no you, you started out leading th with that so but, <laughs> but but i do think that um that uh um everything that i am also is cor incorporated into my art so there's not like there's a partition between my art and what I make and my life and how I want to live it. And mm -hmm. so um, my parents early on, um, my dad was a, was a high school teacher. Uh, my mom um, did a lot of volunteer work and uh, was a, a, a stay at home mom. Um, but she was constantly pushing all of us to learn as much as we could. She brought me to museums. She tried to expose me to art. She tried to get me to take art classes and I didn't like them very much. <laughs> and um, so, so, uh, but we also, uh, we didn't have very much money. Um, and most of our vacations were camping vacations around uh, Lake Superior and um, sort of Northwoods of Minnesota. And my aesthetic sense was shaped very much by childhood experiences, um, probably reinforced with being with family. So everything was safe. It felt it felt um, really comforting, you know, being surrounded by uh, people that I loved. And um, my outlook was shaped by that. I was uh, in the summer sent off to summer, uh, learned um, uh, outdoor skills and, um, the things that I saw and the, the things that I experienced reinforced everything from early childhood until now about aesthetics and what I thought was really important. And so even now, um, when I'm making artwork, I'm, I'm still connected to my childhood, but I'm also connected to those things that I value that are not quite as materialistic maybe as some experiences could be and are founded on really basic and sort of mundane experiences of just being able to see and appreciate the world around me, to breathe, to be active, to move, things that I'm really blessed to have been able to do. So in some respects, um, my aesthetic sense is, is shaped by good fortune and kind of a simple life. And I want to bring that also to people. Um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of a, it's like a foundational kind of experience being human. I think um, human experiences is, is probably more about relating to the outdoor world and basic kinds of existential things than it is fancy, you know, more convoluted, more technological, more fashion minded, more 
sort of advanced civilization kinds of stuff. At our core, I think we're all still just very basic and in essence kind of primitive too. And um, but an appreciation of the the um, beauties of this world that we exist in, I think, is one of those things that can take almost like a primitive sensibility and bring a sense of civility and um, civilization, um, start getting into values that involve uh, aesthetics and caring about the world around you and all that stuff is wrapped into my art. So I, um, when I was in high school, I was a competitive swimmer. Um, post um, high school, I took up cross country ski racing and, um, um, also canoe racing and uh, continued doing uh, wilderness canoe trips and uh, did triathlons and um, was uh, really interested in kind of fish pushing my physical sort of capabilities moving through the world and most of the places that I was doing this were outdoors so they were also you know kind of um, unsupported in some respects you know um, and uh, that also uh, affected my aesthetic sense. And it all kind of fits to, into what I was doing as a kid, what I valued, and in, in some respects, being an animal in this world, you know, moving through it, learning how to use my, whatever this is that I'm traveling around in. Exactly, yeah, absolutely. Can you tell me about some of your favorite um, physical places outdoors that you go now, like if you need some inspiration or you just really want to feel like a peaceful spot you want to get away to? Is yeah. there a place you have or do you kind of any outdoor beautiful scene will do for you? Uh, it, it is possible that any outdoor beautiful scene will do. However, I, um, I probably think about Lake Superior as being my mecca. I I like to get up to the Lake Superior region. Um, somehow it it does things for you know what we'll call my soul, and I'm sure that it's partly because of my childhood and the family experiences that I had um, camping around Lake Superior. We we um, camped on Madeline Island for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. My dad grew up in Ironwood, Michigan, and so we camp up in that area and. The Upper Peninsula, Northern Wisconsin, Northern Minnesota, um, and the Canadian Shield country, those are all places I, I really love to go. I just, somehow I feel at home. Um, and I, I know those places and I, I'm really comfortable there regardless of the weather, you know. So that's, those are my places. And I think there's also something to be said for the comfort of a sense of nostalgia. Like when yes. you entered those spaces again, you can maybe revert back to a little bit of who you were when you were forming these memories and what connected yes. you in the first place. Yes. I you know, and I also think, Christina, somewhere along in those lines is that the idea that we still are deep inside us, even though we might be mature and um, capable of dealing with a lot of things in our lives now, we still have that inner child inside us. Mm -hmm. And that inner child can be provoked. It can be um, sometimes um, hurt, uh, but it's still, you know, we are the package that we started out with, with layers and layers and layers and layers of skills and maturity and wisdom and knowledge and so forth built upon that, but that's still inside us. Yeah, I love to think that way, that that's still there. That doesn't really mm -hmm. go away, it just right. builds on top of. Right, but you know, along those lines, I'd say that, at, that in, my, in my art and in my life, I like to try to honor that child in, um, and bring out sort of childlike experiences, not childish experiences. Sure, that's a good- The, child, the yeah. childish is the bad side of the child. The childlike is the wonder, you know, and the sort of the, the innocence, the ability to see things with fresh eyes and even share them in creative ways that seem kind of bizarre in some, you know, but, but creative, you, you know, you get when a, when a kid is telling you something, they don't have the words for it. I feel right. like art kind of like that. We don't really have the words we're trying, but somehow we can connect something that is like a, an aesthetic moment and share it. I love that. That's perfect. Exactly. Yes. Well, John, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been 
exactly what I wanted out of this new interview but, series, and it's been really great to get to know you a little bit better, and I hope everybody watching there gets to enjoy this experience. I do like to end these asking the same three questions, so these can be rapid-fire answers, or you can go into a little more detail. Um, the first of those is, when you work in your studio, would you say that you are very neat or extremely messy when you work on your art? I'm a slob. Um, I'm a slob. <laughs> when, when I was growing up, uh, my, my mom eventually uh, gave me a little place off in a corner of the basement that no one would have to walk through uh, so I could make my stuff. And um, it was always a mess. And it doesn't look like a mess right now, but oh, I knew I was going to get yeah, I was on, I was going to be on video, but it's like, uh, you know, that, that Peanuts cartoon character Pigpen who has this cloud of dust and stuff coming off him all the time. That's how I am when I'm creating. It's like there's stuff going on behind me, you know, just like piece of paper and everything. And, and then I can't find stuff and it's, <laughs> it, it's frustrating. I'm cursing myself and, you know, it's, I'm a mess. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you have an artistic pet peeve at all or not really? Um, I don't really have a, a, a pet peeve, and I would say that when I, um, you know, I, I look at my own work, I think, as uh, critically as I look at all work, and so if I see something in someone else's work that either inspires me or I think, oh boy, I, I wish they hadn't done that, I often find it in my own as well, oh. and so... Um, you know, it's not, it's not a peeve. Um, I think it's good to look at stuff and it's, and it's good to be self-critical also when looking sure, at it's stuff. It's sort of a mirror that you yeah. can Okay. Yeah. And last question, can you tell me about the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, the best or any I advice you'd like to give to someone else out there? Well, I would say, um, that the most important advice that I could give is to be genuine. Um, and um, I think that that also requires that you don't be too sort of uh, self-conscious and not, not, don't hope too much for what other people might think of you, but rather try constantly to be deserving of whatever positive, perspective anybody does give back to you so that also means that you have to be really self-critical in the things that you do the things that you make and the things that you're sending out into the world and um i think it's it's um less likely for example that you'll create a masterpiece and um more likely that you can keep doing good things and eventually it's possible if you keep working and you keep doing good things that maybe someday create a masterpiece. 